All right. So, hey guys, welcome to uh, the webinar with Chicago RIA uh, today. And this is a, obviously the meetings that we usually do are down given uh, the set of circumstances. And hence, we've been doing these updates and these meetings uh, through uh, kind of the forum, through the uh, webinars. And we have a ton of, ton of people just reg registered today. So I'm gonna kind of go through a breakdown. First, I'm gonna cover the current situation uh, from a state of, from a real estate standpoint, uh, some of the emotional things that people uh, will go through whenever something like this happens, uh, some of the reasonable responses uh, to it, and then how do we deal with it going into the future? And you will see these updates. We had done one of these about a week or so ago. This is the second one. Uh, that we're doing and we're gonna continue to do these because what we've always advocated is you have to think through whatever you do in life, be it real estate investing, whatever you do, this is a financial transaction and you need to think through it so that there is a better outcome. So uh, first of all, obviously we all know that maybe about uh, 50, 60%, 70% of the world is currently under a lockdown to prevent a problem that they don't want to happen. What I think the biggest injustice today that is happening is uh, social media. It's a great way for people to connect. Unfortunately, the transmission of information, or I should say misinformation that happens in uh, today's world is very, very unfortunate. A lot of people uh, seem, and I know people are trying to be lighthearted, people are trying to be uh, April Fool's jokes, all that kind of stuff in an environment that we are in. For every single minute updates about what happened with one particular person with, uh, or what happened with one particular country, I just think it's irresponsible uh, for people that is going on. But that's just my personal take on it. So let's deal with what's going on with real estate. Now, I had expected that as soon as the shutdown started um, within some of the states, that we would suddenly see some of the contracts, some of the offers that were coming in on properties to go away. Fortunately, that has not happened. If anything, a bunch of people put their flips on the market, and we're talking about uh, smaller price range of flips. We're talking about less than about 350 or so, those types of flips. And fortunately, uh, homeowners who have good stable jobs, they work for the state, they have uh, long-term employment, they've realized this is a great opportunity for them to be able to buy the home. Um, hopefully they're practicing social distancing and we have seen that offers are coming in from all around. In general, agents are telling us that at least in a, a bread and butter price range, uh, that has not necessarily been hit hard, which is a positive sign. Now, will it remain that way? We don't know, that is yet to be seen, uh, but yet, what we have advised everybody from Mastery as well as what we're suggesting to you, if you have big projects that are going on, what you should be doing is you should be thinking about uh, conservating your capital. That should be something that you should think about is how do I conserve my capital in case things get bad? So between Rahul and I, uh, we own a few hundred uh, rental properties and we have practiced what we preach for the last uh, seven or 10 years, which is we don't live on our rental incomes. What we have done is all this time, we've been busy buying better quality rental properties as the years have gone along and we've been paying off some of these rental properties. So in the short term, uh, even people like us, do we have a problem? No. Do Would we have a problem in a very long term um, if uh, we continue to basically, nobody quits paying, uh, you know, everybody quits paying rent. Of course, at some point you will develop a problem. It may take four, five, six, seven, eight months, but the question today becomes is you should be thinking about conservating capital because whenever there is uh, times of turmoil, what we have to think is, okay, let's just kind of stay put a little bit. That doesn't mean there are two types of people today. One is, oh my God, the whole world is over, right? And that person is just basically a pessimist and I happen not to be a pessimist. I happen to be a short-term uh, pessimist and I happen to be a long-term optimist. 
And what do I mean by that? If you are a real estate investor, in fact, if you invest in anything and if you're going to be successful, you have to have this sort of a uh, mindset, which is in the short term, things can go wrong, yet over a longer period of time, things are going to be okay. Because if you are just a long-term pessimist and you think every single thing is going to go in a hell and handbasket, I think there's something mentally wrong with you. Because then the question becomes is, why are you even alive? Why do you live day to day? How do you manage to get up every single day and run your life? Because if you just always think that everything is going bad, it's just worse than it has been. And so before we get into exactly what we do with real estate, I want to put things in perspective a little bit. And just understand, I'm not uh, one of those people who goes, you know, when you, the odds are 100% against you, you should go uphill. I have never been that type of person. I tend to think through, try to think through at least, where are we reasonably? Is something really coming to an end? Is it the end all be all? Most of us, if we live in America, have come to America within the last three to four generations, most of us right? That is about 95% of the American population that have been in this country uh, relatively to the history of the world over a short period of time. Most of us are all immigrants at some point in history, right? And what you have to think about is most of these countries that we left, most of these countries, you didn't come to America because just because. See, people have come to America for one reason and one reason only, because it is still, and it has been for the past 100, 150 years, a country that is full of hope and better things are possible than where you came from. That's just a fact of life. You like it, you don't like it, and today at a time like this, it is not about politics. We all have our opinions about how things should be and how things could be better, sure. But yet, we should feel very blessed that we live in a very, very great country. Why? Because at the end of the day, if you look at it from any which way, we are at the top of the food chain compared to 99.9% .9 of the world. I don't care if you include Europe in that population, right? Europe is the third or fourth most populated country in this world. And economically, even the poor people, as we like to, to, uh, like to talk about it within the United States, if you really want to see poverty just at one, one time in your life, when, you, when all this is over, go look at some countries like India, China, some parts of Mexico, you'll understand what poverty really is. So as much as we all, sometimes we all do it, moan and complain about things, I do it, everybody does it, right? We're very, very blessed. Even with this crisis, we're blessed to be where we are with the systems that we have in place. That's number one, that's my belief system. But if we look at the history, kind of historically, where things have been, and then we will bring it to the present day today, right? If we take, we roll back the clock about 100 years or so, which is back in uh, 1920s, right? People have a very nostalgic feeling. Well, you don't understand, Andrew, how things were supposed to be, how things used to be. It used to be great. Guys, listen, we live in a better time in history than the world ever has. You realize just 50, 60, 80 years ago, right? Something like this happened. Millions and millions of people would have died even before anybody realized what the hell was going on. Compared to that, because of modern medicine, where we are in time and history, we are very, very blessed. And the world is not all bad and not all things are bad, as far as I'm concerned. Because if you look historically on where the market was, right? In uh, sometime around the 1900s, when if we st look at the stock market, this happens to be a graph, uh, if you look at my uh, computer uh, screen, of kind of where the stock market was, where it went up to, how it climbed, and what the recovery period was. The recovery period was almost a 15, 18 year recovery period. And then we had a rise up to about 1930s, right? There was a huge run up. And then we had the Great Depression, as it, known, uh, as it is called in America. 
and that was in 1933 or so. That's where we had the Great Depression. Now, I'm not going to get into the precedents. I'm not going to get into the history of this. I happen to be an avid um, reader of this kind of stuff because I always want to understand where have we been? How were times when things were really bad? How were they handled and how long did it take? Today, we live in a microwave society, in meaning that the upsides are basically about a 10 years, and yet the downsides, even if we want to say the 2008 re uh, recession was bad, relatively compared to history, it was not as bad because people lost properties, not only in the United States, around the world. If we in the United States get hurt, guess what happens around the world? China gets hurt, India gets hurt, Europe gets hurt, Africa gets hurt, uh, South America gets hurt, every single place. We don't live in an isolated world today. We're all interconnected. And because of that, if the people who are at the top of the food chain, meaning the largest consumers in the world, are still Americans, if we're hurting, everybody in the world is hurting because it is a domino effect. We're all tied through. Now, some people can look at it as bad, some people can look at it as positive. I happen to look at it in a positive light. Why? The reason behind that is this, that when an incident like what we're facing today happens, and when the entire world pretty much is shut down economically, and it's shut down so that we prevent a loss of life, a bigger thing than just the economy itself, right? All the pundits, everybody, oh my God, it's been unprecedented. Nothing has happened ever before. You go back 20, 30 years, 40 years, right? You go to the Middle East, you go to some parts of the world, people were dying, they were getting bombed. Really, is that any better than what is going on today? I think today, in fact, people at least have food to eat to the most extent, right? At least in America, at least we're better off. The catastrophe Catastrophe is a, what is going on, economic stopping business as usual, is to prevent the loss of life. I think it is a positive thing. Now, how does it, it's not positive in terms of economy, so don't get me right wrong in that way. I'm not saying it's, but what I'm think, saying is a lot worse things have happened. If you look at kind of how long it took from 1933 to recover for the stock market just to come back to normal, right? That entire period of it collapsing and it going back up to the status quo, that was a 25 year period. Imagine that. Yet, how do we remember the 50s? We remember the 50s in America, right? See, a lot of times there's a nostalgia that is attached to the past because for all of us, our experiences based on when you were born, let's say you were born in 1940s, and for the next 10, 15 years, 18 years, 20 years, you saw a straight curve of the market going up. So then what do you remember that as? You remember that as the roaring 40s or 50s or 60s. That's how we remember because that's based on our experience. But yet, the generation of parents that came before that, they remember the Great Depression. If you talk to anybody who was older or your grandmother uh, age people, they will remember that Great Depression, and they are a product of their experiences, meaning they tend to be very frugal, they tend to be very tight with money, they tend to be, because why? Because they had an experience at one time in history when literally there were bread lines. If you come from Europe, you come from a lot of other countries, you know exactly what I'm talking about, because in the history of humankind, we have faced those kind of issues yet. We don't face those issues today. Today, our biggest problem is we're buying too much damn toilet paper. Today, our biggest problem is we're buying too much meat products, and hence, the grocery stores are running out of it. Not because there is lack of, but it's because of fear, and people actually have the cash in their hands or on their credit cards to go swipe it and buy excess of it. And we all, to a certain extent, when there's fear and uncertainty, we want to make sure our little world, our little family becomes safe. And that is okay, but just understand in the big scheme of things, where are things? I don't, again, believe that everything is come to, coming to an end. We have to be cautious, yet optimistic about the future. Now, as we get into the 50s and the 60s, 
where was the market? The market kind of stagnated in the big history of things. Obviously, there was ups, there were downs, and then straight from sometime around the 1990s. And if you look into 2001 or so, if we go up kind of uh, somewhere around here in this particular graph, what you notice is all the way up to about 2000s, the stock market completely went berserk. See, whenever the market is on the upside, right? Nobody counts their blessings and nobody looks at last 10 years that it was ridiculous how high it really went. And then <clears throat> we all know we had a crash uh, of the stock market where a lot of people lost a lot of money because they were doing things that were irrational. And yet throughout 2000, 2001, 2002, relatively in the big scheme of things, the market necessarily did not crash. Now, did that mean that a lot of people did lose money? They did. If you look at kind of the downturns, there were downturns. Yet all the way up to 2007 or so, the beginning of 2006 and 7, the market was good. Why? Because the housing was what was pushing the market through. Every time you buy a or sell a house, you either buy a house or you sell a house, there are 18 to 30 other jobs, depending on how you look at it. When you buy a house, not only we think about it, well, a real estate agent makes commission. Well, what about the attorney? What about the title company? What about all the people who work at the title company? You go out, you buy more toilet paper, you buy more furniture, you buy more things for your new home. That has a domino effect. Housing, singularly, housing compared to anything else. Why? Because it is simple. It's food and shelter. Besides your health, it's all about food and it's all about shelter. That one industry impacts every single industry in America and not only in America, but throughout the world. And fortunately, we all happen to be in that particular industry. Now, if you look at 2007 and 8, we all know what happened to the stock market in 2007 and 8. And it suddenly had a drop. Now, if you look at it all the way from, uh, let's say, zero virtually to 10,000, it took a very, very, very long amount of time. And yet from 10,000 to 20,000, if you look at kind of the time period in history, that's only a 10-year time period. And so today, when we had a few days ago, when we had a drop in the market from 24,000, it suddenly came down, uh, or for 25,000, that it suddenly came down. In the big scheme of things, is it all over? No, I don't believe so. Our basic needs are met, and yet this crisis is a financial crisis because of the economic, economic shutdown. Why do I say that? How does it relate to housing? Yet it took six years to recover from the mess that we were in, but it did recover. People who did well, you realize as the market has done well in the last six, seven, eight years, that a lot of people became wealthier, much, much, much wealthier than they were before. That as a society, just two weeks ago, we were a wealthier society than we were in 2000, than we were in 2005. We were much wealthier. It's called every time the market goes up, somebody is profiting and in general a rising market raises all tides and when the market collapses a big significant part of the u.s economy or the world economy there's loss of dollars but yet again it will rise there is no two nights back to back i say that because i want to put this in the big larger scheme of things so if we look at the real estate market right and this i'll break down a little bit more and i'm going to use the average uh, price of a home adjusted for inflation to demonstrate this point, and hopefully this will make some monogram of sense. Now, just understand that when 9-11 happened, what was the narrative you heard? Oh, we have never had this sort of a thing happen in America. Of course, we never had that sort of a thing happen in America. And we all, if you remember where you were, we all probably remember that moment where we were at the time of 9-11. We all remember the days, if you're old enough, to... <coughs> In 2005 or six or seven, I was selling real estate at that time uh, in 2006 and seven. So I remember what I felt like, that feeling in your gut where you just don't know what to turn. Every time you hear the news, you feel just terrible. You want to jump off a bridge because you're like, oh my God, it's all over. 
guess what? The job of the newsmakers is to do one thing. Their job is to deliver ratings. Their job is not, news just happens to be a part of it. So what they do is they make it very, very, very salacious. And even if you are in middle of Iowa, growing corn, you're concerned about the stock market collapsing because how now you, the Mr. Farmer, are going to start. Your life is going to be over. Why do they do that? They do that because that's the only way they can manage to get our attention, right? So if we look at the housing market, let's say in 1963, uh, the, if there was a house that was purchased for 19,500, 1963, right? That house by 1970 was worth about $27,000. That same house in about 1975, I should say, I messed, I missed, messed that up a little bit. In 1975, that same house was worth $41,000. By 85, in a 10 year period, that same house had almost more than doubled in value. It was almost worth $100,000, 98,500 to be exact. By 1990s, now all the gray areas where you see these shaded areas, each of these at that time in history were called depressions, were called recessions. Uh, that's what those gray shaded areas indicate. By 1990, that house was worth $153,000. Now, it depends when you bought the property versus when you sold it. But if you bought the property in 1963, imagine, you lived in the home at that time, the average family, it's not like today, the average family lived in the house 20, 30 years. That's where people would grow up, three bedroom, one bath house, five people living in it. That was the norm. I mean, imagine, let's say if we take a suburb like Skokie, if you could afford to live in Skokie at one time, since we happen to be in Chicago, you were doing well. And you could have bought a three bedroom, one bath ranch at that time in history in the 60s for $55,000. If you bought one for $62,000, which had a garage, you were the rich person on the block because a lot of those houses were barely 850, 900 square feet. If you had a finished basement, oh my God, you have a finished basement and you have a garage, that was a big deal. See, we forget where we came from and we forget our historical context. Think about it. In 2005, that same house that was bought in the 60s or in the 70s even in Skokie, in Chicago, it was worth, it had gone all the way from 62, 65, 68,000, $70,000. It had gone all the way up to 300 dollars and $400,000. Now you say, but Andrew, that's a long period of time, I agree. But if we look at 63 here, all the way to 1990, the property prices went up in relation, and this is adjusted for inflation, mind you, till $153,000. This is the average property in America. If we go to 2005, that same property would have been worth about $288,000. That same property would have been worth $322,000 in 2007. And that same property would go down in 2011 down to $260,000. These are numbers that are absolutely amazing when you really put it on a graph and start thinking about it and start looking at it, that how much, now the question becomes is, did you know at the point in time where you are in history when you're investing? See, a lot of times people think in real estate, you buy a property cheap, you fix up the property, and then you sell it for a profit. The problem is if life was that simple, then you would have made money every single time. Yet the problem is if you bought the property in 2007 and the property prices are escalating down for the first six and seven years, if you didn't know how to manage real estate, guess what would have happened? You've done all the right things, yet you would have lost almost 50, 40, 50, $60,000 in value in that home. And you would have said, I mean, Andrew, I thought I was investing. That was not investing at that time because it did not make sense in 2007 to buy the property at that current price and hold it through 2000, to, all the way through 2011. Now, if it's a home that you're living in, what can you do about it? We all need a home to live. Let's say you happen to buy, so happened to be that in Bartlett at one, uh, 2007, I happened uh, to buy a townhome at that time and I fixed it up. That was the first property I ever did a fix and flip on. 
I actually, I did a fix, I should say. I didn't do a flip. I was living in the property. So it went all the way from about 350,000 to all the way down to about 220, 230. And then it started rising back up, right? But because I was living in it, because I was living in it for a part of the time, and then I rented it out, because I was living in it, it really didn't matter. Not that I liked the fact that the prices went down, but I was living in it. I needed a place to live. So it didn't really make a difference yet if you take it a little bit forward. So if we take that time from 2007, by 2015, we had pretty much come back, if not exceeded, and this is not going to hold true for every single uh, town in America. This is going to be across the board in general if we average it out for America. Now, if you're somewhere in the middle of nowhere, obviously you did not see as dramatic a collapse and you did not see as dramatic a rise either. But if you take some places like California, New York, uh, Phoenix, uh, Miami, Atlanta, some of the big, big, uh, the far west coast, the far south, there was a huge swing in prices. Even in Chicago, we saw a huge swing in prices, and then we saw a taper off, and then we again started a turn. In 2012, for the first time, somewhere around here is where we saw the turn. So if you, depends on when you invest in housing, it will have an impact in terms of what happens to you, yet my point being is it's not all over. In 2017, by sorry, 2019, that same property was up to about $382,000, which is kind of where we sit today. So what do we do and how do we deal with it? Number one is that if, as we face this crisis, right, the ec economy has been basically brought to stop, to a halt around the world, and hence, what impact does it have? So what impact does it have on uh, wholesales? What impact does it have on flips? And in flips, it's gonna be small flips, bread and butter flips, which we always encourage people, if you're going to do a flip, do a small flip. Don't go do big flips. This is what we have always consistently said. So what in impact does it have on new construction, right? Spec builds and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and then what impact does it have on rentals? Now, if you look at this time in history, there's a lot of people uh, on the net, there are two types of people, right? There's that one person, oh my God, life is over and there's no tomorrow. Then there's the other person, oh my God, you can't wait. There's so much opportunity, you can make millions. And I think both approaches are very, very foolish today. Because why? Because the economy has been brought to a grinding halt. So if you're that one person that you think, oh my God, there's a bunch of opportunity, I think you're a fool. And I think you're just lying to people. Or if you're that person, oh my God, the end of the world, well, then it doesn't matter anyways, right? So I think there needs to be a little bit more thought through approach and there needs to be a little bit of financial adjustment that we need to do. So this is just my personal belief. If you're somebody that is doing wholesaling and you're doing wholesaling in the basic bread and butter price range to the most extent. Now, I know I'm sure somebody's gonna call us or somebody will comment and say, Andrew, but you don't understand. I'm, I just did a wholesale yesterday for a property that's 400,000. Good for you. Number one, I would like to see it, but good for you. I would suggest that if you're going to do wholesaling today, what you do is you do wholesaling to people who have cash, who are not going to a bank to get a loan. If you're going to do wholesale, make sure your wholesale buyer is locked in. So let's just say you put up 1K in earnest money or $500 in earnest money to tie up the deal or 100 bucks, whatever it is, that you get your buyer on the hook for $3,000, $5,000 non-refundable deposit so that your cash is not on the hook. Don't go promise sellers all kinds of things. Now, what it does do is this, in an economy like today, on the other side of it, see, there's always a yin, there's always a yang, right? Meaning there's a good part of it, there's a bad part of it. So in an economy like today, you can't believe the amount of calls we're getting from distressed homeowners that were in distress, that didn't want the properties to begin with, now suddenly they're like, oh my God, we have to sell. They're desperate sellers. But the problem is because the economy is at a halt, we just need to be careful. That doesn't mean that you don't get properties under contract. 
but please don't go out promise things to let's say REO agents that are selling a property pr make big promises and then you end up canceling the transactions don't do that but if you have homeowners if you have direct from seller type of contacts can you get the property under contract and then don't promise that yes we're going to uh, close for sure in the next 30 days just say hey guys listen would love to buy the property we're going to buy it but we just have to deal with the present day conditions see in a market like today everybody understands that it is what it is this may take 30 days it may take 60 days we just don't know the amount of time it's going to take to get past this right so even if you're going to get a property under contract this is the best time to go after uh, homeowners that are in some sort of distress that are probate deals that are short sale deals those are the things i would go after right now i would necessarily not go after online auction type of deals now am i saying that you can't find one you can find it but make sure whatever the current value is today whatever the current value is let's just say the back end value on the property is 220 that's the value and let's say your buy price your strike price you're buying it so the typical formula we use is 220 you take 70% of that minus your rehab costs right and then you come up with the max allowable offer so let's say your max allowable offer today <clears throat> based on today's number is going to be 110 what i would do in today's market is this i would go down about 15 or 20% on that 110 and make an offer at 90 make an offer at 80 85 see today if you make an offer that is 15 20% even more conservative guess what you're doing you're giving yourself that room for error so even if things open up in a month or so and the market adjusts itself you have kept up or you have kept you're below the adjustment price with stocks you can have a 500 800 point drop one day well typically today nowadays there's a 500 point drop they drop the they stop the market right but the stock market can tickle down very very quickly that doesn't happen typically with the real estate market the real estate market can come down over a year's worth of time five ten fifteen percent so even if you bought the property at a huge discount what happens is you have a safe bet so if you're going to do wholesales today as long as you make sure your attorney approval so the biggest thing is your attorney approval needs to be kept open your village inspections need to be kept open why because there's some of the villages are working some of the villages are not working right so those types of things you need to just as long as you hedge your bets you're totally totally fine now anything that is big bigger type of houses unless you have a buyer that you're for sure is going to buy the property i would be cautiously optimistic about it doesn't mean you stop but i would be much more cautious and i would be much more conservative now on the flips so we're going to talk about flips and then we'll talk about rentals uh, tenants not paying more uh, their uh, rentals and then how do you deal with if you have a bunch of outstanding loans right so in terms of your flips how i would look at it is if you have small flips small flips are ready try and look at the numbers if there are properties that are under contract guys listen in a market like today this is just me this is how my brain has always worked i always think about one thing first you have to survive and then you have to profit right meaning the biggest rule of investing is rule number one and that is don't lose money right and the rule number two is don't forget rule number one and my belief has always been is this don't be greedy in today's market if you have a flip you have a property which is under contract and they want the shirt off your damn back give it to them as long as you're not losing money to me that is the biggest biggest issue whenever something happens economically see 2008 9 10 11 12 13 every time the market was coming down yet i was doing flips and making profits because i was always very super conservative so today if you have properties great now if you're in the middle of a new construction you're in the middle of a big uh, project you may have an a, an issue but if you do have an issue so let's just say you're doing new construction or let's just say you're doing i just got a call from somebody yesterday 
two days ago, uh, over the weekend, and they're like, well, we're doing a 300,000 buy uh, is what they bought the property for. They did almost 350,000 in work. I'm like, how far are you? They're like, man, I was supposed to put the property on the market right now. I said, listen, here's what you do. Call your lender, right? Uh, so call your finance financing partner and, and just say, hey, listen, we have a problem uh, that we see coming. So far, we've been able to make, pro uh, make uh, uh, payments, but pick up the phone, call them and say, hey, listen, we're gonna be delayed. I need a six month extension. And the other thing is, I can't have you basically hurting my credit if I cannot make the construction payments, if I cannot make the payments on the loan, I need a deferment, right? And I'm like, just, they're like, well, but what do we base it on? I'm like, nothing, just blame the corona, right? Everybody understands today that clearly there is an issue. I'm like, do it ahead of time and then don't tell them that this is it and this is gonna work. Just tell them that, listen, I'm gonna make the best of the situation to try to get rid of the property, but at some point, I may need further help. Try to address that problem ahead of time because guess what? Every lender understands, given the set of circumstances that they don't want. When you shut down the entire country, when you shut down more than half of the world, everybody understands there's a problem. But the more you ask for help and the quicker you ask for help, right? What happens is you're not considered a defaulter. See, if the bank basically gives you an adjustment and they say, okay, we're going to defer the payments, now you're not in default. The point of a market crash like this or a, the point of a uh, pandemic like this or whenever something goes wrong is not just for you to survive. The point of this should be for you to grow. What happens six months from now? What happens eight months from now? What happens a year from now is what I'm concerned with. And how do we protect what we have? Not necessarily make a large profit, protect what we have. That's the most important rule and not lose money. And then how do we put ourselves in a position at the end of this to grow? So that's the profit. If you have a new construction, you're doing a bigger project, please call your lender right away and say, hey, listen, I can make the payment this month or I can't make the payment, I need a deferment. And even if you have reserves, look, keep those reserves. Those reserves are much better in your bank account than in your banker's bank account. Why? Because today they're not gonna ding you on your credit. They're not gonna ding you in terms of that, oh my God, how is it that you failed the loan? No, it's a unforeseen circumstance that nobody can control. If you have small flips that you're getting into, basically, and they're all done. You can, last week, my point was don't put them on the market, but from the data that I'm seeing, right? There are a lot of offers that are coming in on the smaller properties. So because there's a lack of inventory and the buyers are out still looking. So if we can get rid of those properties, God bless, get rid of them. And I would not hesitate for price reductions because believe me, there's going to be opportunity because this whole crisis. So that's said and done uh, for properties. Now, if you were starting a new construction and you're in the middle of it, you got an issue. But what I would try to do is I would not open up 10 projects at once. I would not have a bunch of projects open. The ones that you can manage financially, those are the only ones I would do. I would much rather see you have cash in your pocket. Don't do what people did in 2008, 9, and 10. A lot of these people could have saved themselves. But what they did is they kept keeping people on payroll because we all feel through this times, correct me if I'm wrong, if you have felt that, oh my God, what is going to happen? Oh my God, I need to help. Oh my God, I'm so blessed compared to other people. Oh my God, I don't know what's gonna happen, right? Those emotional roller coaster, everybody goes through at different levels wherever they are. So don't make decisions, don't do things just based on how you feel in that minute in time. Because what we need to make a decision and we need to make uh, wise decisions as to what happens in the next uh, six months and eight months. That's what we're basing it on. So now let's talk about rentals. There's this conversation that came out about rentals that, well, reach out to the tenants and we should be helping each other. We should be holding everybody's hand. Kumbaya, great, good, right? Nothing wrong with it. But here's the deal. If you are a landlord, if you're somebody that owns rental properties, see, you have a higher responsibility, meaning you have to look at the financial decisions that you have made and make sure that first you have to protect your own home, your own backyard, before you try to start helping everybody else. 
my personal belief is I would not rent, reach out to the tenants right now and I would not send them letters that if you can't pay, we will do this and we will do that. I wouldn't do that. I would follow the protocol and the process that is laid out, which is after five days, there is a typically, if people are late by five days, we serve a uh, the notice. Uh, I'm forgetting that exact word for it, but it's basically that you haven't paid rent, and if you don't pay rent, we're going to pursue uh, further action, so on and so forth, right? Um, so I would follow the same protocol, but I today I would not go and basically start trying to find a way to throw people out, right? Because number one, the courts are closed. Number two, they're not doing any evictions. They're not doing any rentals. Today, our job is to try to work with people, but I would not encourage people from not paying your rent or to start making deals. People who pay rents, let them pay rents. People who cannot pay rents are a little bit late. Uh, they tell you, try not to charge them late fees. Be reasonable in today's time frame. Why? Because just as they need help, you at some point may be in a position that you may need help. So you want to keep those lines of communication open. Other thing, if tenants can only pay half your rent, three quarters of the rent, whatever the case may be, that's fine. If you have Section 8 tenants and you have money coming from Section 8, but you don't have the tenants portion paid, that doesn't mean, in my opinion, that it's forgiven. It means it can be paid back in the next three, four, five, six months uh, at a little bit later point. It's deferred. That is what we would suggest, right? Don't just start immediately making decisions today that you may regret in the short, near short term. So that's number one. Number two, if you have any properties that are residential properties, uh, sorry, rental properties that you have a residential loan on, meaning any loan that is a Fannie or Freddie loan, any property that is a Fannie or Freddie loan, all your banks from Chase to Wells Fargo to any of the big banks, they're offering already programs where your payments are not going to be considered late. Number two, they, you have to ask for deferment. And number three, that it will not affect it will not affect your credit, which are the most important things. So you're basically, what you're doing in turn is you're modifying that loan. And let's just say they give you a three-month deferment today, or they give you a six-month deferment. What it is, what they're saying is they're deferring that payment. They're not saying you're not on the hook for it, right? They're just saying, hey, we're deferring it, and as long as you live by whatever you agree. So let's say six months from now, things are stabilized, things go back to normal in the next couple of months, and then people start catching back up. Uh, at some point, if you have to do an eviction, you have to do an eviction, and you go back to your payment schedule, it does not show up. It's agreed as paid. That is what it's gonna show up on your credit report, which means your everything is on schedule and you're not behind on anything. That's important because Preserving our credit is the most important goal whenever something like this happens and making sure in the future we can continue to grow. So on residential loans, and this is important, on residential loans, make sure you take the deferments that are being offered and it is not a negative on you. This is, uh, this is something critical. On commercial loans that you may have uh, gotten, uh, that are hedge fund back loans. So if you bought a property and it's a commercial prop, it's a residential property that you're renting out, whatever the case may be, and you have a loan from Chicago Funding, you have a loan from Finance America, you have a loan from Lima, you have a loan from any of those type of lenders. On these, same exact thing. You can ask for a deferment and they will give it to you. Already the feds are out to them also saying, hey, listen, we don't want everybody in America going belly up. We wanna make sure we're working with them. Now, that has nothing to do, the deferment that you're being offered, what you're paying, not paying, whatever, that has nothing to do with your tenant. The tenant, as of right now, if things may change, as of right now, they're still on the hook for their rent, but you may work with them based on their given circumstances. So if somebody's retired, they're still getting their pension, they're still getting paid, uh, they still have income coming in. What does that have to do? Because you're still financially responsible for your rental property. Nobody's getting you off the hook just because something like this happens. Sooner or later, the bank is going to say, hey, listen, man, you got to pay. So you can't just set people up using this environment and saying, well, no, you don't have to make uh, rental payments. That would be a bloody disaster for your portfolio. But 
on commercial loans that are institutional loans. And this is important. On any institutional loans, you can also apply for a deferment. This is okay also. The only loans where I would not go and ask for deferment are loans from small banks or small lenders. These are people that do portfolio loans, right? I would not yet, yet go and ask from them from small banks or portfolio lenders. If you may have loans at Chicago RIA uh, portfolio lender, right? We have a ton of people, especially in mastery, we have a ton of people. There's a group of about 750, 800 people that own over 9,000 houses, right? So most of them have uh, rental residential loans. Uh, another huge group has properties that are under commercial institutional financing. Both of these are okay to ask for a deferment because that does not count against you. That does not count tomorrow the prices, let's say, get adjusted by 10, 15 percent, 40 percent once all of this gets cleared up and boom, you start buying more. These two loans being deferred, it doesn't hurt you in any way, right? With smaller banks, with uh, portfolio type of lenders, it may not hurt you on your credit. Your credit will be perfectly fine because they're offering the deferment. But when they have a lot of opportunities that come up, you might not be the first person that is considered to take advantage of those opportunities. So let's say uh, you have 10 properties, five or six of the tenants paid, two or three other tenants, one or two tenants just couldn't pay at all. There are three or four tenants that paid partially. I would parse that out based on where the loan is placed as to how you're going to react to that. So uh, number one, for that, I'm gonna have uh, kind of Rahul come in and give his input a little bit because for us, he manages that whole side of the business uh, between my properties and his properties, uh, all of us, those we own together. So these are a couple hundred properties. So the same issue that you have, we just have it on a much larger scale. Right? And making a month or two or three months worth of payments are not an issue, but we're not gonna burn through all our savings. And th this is a um, conversation that I had with our lenders that, hey, listen, these are savings, These are this is money we have put aside. So just because uh, we can make the payments, it, we're not gonna burn through all the cash. What if this takes a little bit longer to get cleared up? We don't wanna back ourselves into a corner. So let me make sure Rahul is on and I'll have him maybe contribute a few of his thoughts. And then um, after this, we'll talk about the SBA loans that are available for people who have been distressed by this. If you own a restaurant, if you have real estate, uh, what are some of the other resources that are available and who are some of the people that you can reach out to? There is, just today I had a conversation with a banker. He's like, man, this has like never been done before. They have lowered the standards for SBA loans like no tomorrow, right? And most of us, you, I, anybody, you will qualify because we have been, and it's not necessarily that you have to be broke to qualify, right? You can have money, but your income is gonna get affected, right? It is a true devastation. It's not like you're just making this up. You're being honest that your income is going to get affected or is affected because of all of this. And they want these loans out there. So I'll pull up that page as well. But in the meantime, I want kind of Rahul to share a few of his thoughts, what he's thinking uh, about uh, how we are addressing this issue. So Rahul, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Speak just a little okay. bit louder. Yeah, so basically, uh, as Andrew said, uh, the, the two things right now for anybody who has portfolio like what we have, so our portfolio is uh, over 170 properties. Uh, the, the main thing you're trying to restore is your capital, one thing, and the second thing is you're trying to restore is your credit. Those two things are very important for you for any growth from here onwards, and the deals might come through, but they are not going to come right away. Uh, the things are very, uh, very new right now, so you never know when it's going to come. But you need to have those resources ready for it, so you can actually get uh, take advantage of those uh, of those two things. So for for us, my in, uh, we have a bunch of loans with uh, uh, 
uh, with the residential 30-year programs, which are basically like the your uh, your loan which you get for your own house from Chase Bank, U.S. Bank, those kind of loans, then we have uh, 30 to 40 percent of our portfolio is from 30-year commercial program, which is basically a uh, uh, some sort of a hedge funds. So Chicago Funding has a lot of those uh, lenders, and we have those loans uh, from uh, uh, from the hedge funds. Uh, and then the third category, like he was mentioning, we have a bunch of loans from the small community banks, which are basically the five-year arm or 10-year arm loans, which are from the small banks, where you actually have a good relationship with these managers there. You can actually talk to the decision makers and you want to keep those relationships. So you don't want to burn any relationships in this uh, in this whole thing. But my perspective is, if government is helping you out, there is a problem out there, you might not be able to like uh, get all the rents next month, or maybe this month will be okay. A lot of people are still working. They're working last, last month. So they will be able to uh, pay rent this first month. But if this continues, which we know, that all the businesses are closed till end of the month now. So their next month is gonna be more critical. So it, what the way I see it is, I might collect maybe 70, 80, 90% of rents this month, but the month, which is the May, uh, I might not have, uh, I might not collect 50% or even less than that. So you need to look for that uh, happening uh, in on your portfolio. So any of these programs available, I'll try to use it, but just make sure that you're, you're using it responsibly. So if you're taking the, the deferment program on the third year, which I'm going to take on all our residential properties, they are, going to, they are saying right now, when I was talking with them yesterday and trying to set up all this thing, they say that, okay, you don't have to pay for next 90, 90 days. So the next three months, you don't have to pay any of the mortgages, uh, what you are paying. But after 90 days, when that 90 days come, you have to pay all the three months, three months together. But I still will take that option because I can restore my capital in my account. And at the end of the 90 days, I will pay it off uh, based on what I collected. And obviously, you might get more help if this problem becomes more critical, then you can actually work with them. Those programs are uh, funded by Fannie Freddie. So there's a federal uh, uh, federal program, so they, they'll get more help as compared to your second loan. So second 30-year loans, uh, the same thing, we are going to do the same, uh, same approach. It's just to restore your capital and keep it intact. And then you have an option of paying it off based on what rents you're collecting and what properties uh, are still rented. You can, based on that, you can, uh, you can pay it off. And the third, which is the five-year uh, small banks, we are going to work with those guys uh, because we can directly talk to the decision makers. And then we just have to make sure that we are playing in their, as per their rules and within their rules. So there is no, no conflict for your future growth. And that's the approach uh, we have to take. Same thing on the tenant side. I don't want to open that can of worm by sending them a letter that uh, uh, you might uh, not pay your rent because of the coronavirus and all that. A lot of people are working. You don't know, especially the portfolio, like our portfolio, we don't know what our 170, 80 people are doing right now. We don't know how many people are working, how many people are not working. If I get a letter like that, my first, Im first impression will be, oh, maybe I should not pay now. So it's their responsibility. So our approach to them is, Whatever his bank is telling us that your mortgages are still due. So we are telling them the same story. We are, we are taking the same approach as the banks are telling us to our tenants that we are responsible for our mortgages. That's why we have to collect the rent. And then case by case basis, you can work with them. Obviously you want to give them a little, little bit uh, help if they're really uh, having issues with the coronavirus. So, we are taking that approach and a bunch of people in mastery, uh, we are telling the same guidelines to them. But it, obviously this is gonna be a, a huge impact on everything. I don't think at this stage, anybody can understand what what is gonna impact on the back-end market, when I say back-end the real estate market. So if you're in a flip, it's gonna be, you don't know how much uh, appraisals are gonna get affected uh, in next few months. 
but that's uh, we'll, we'll see as we get into the next month and we'll keep doing this uh, session and updating you based on the information we are getting from the from the financial institutions any other thing i missed andrew Can you hear me? Andrew, I believe you're on mute. Andrew, last few minutes we couldn't able to uh, listen to you. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I put myself. Did, on did mute. you listen? Uh, I don't know when I my voice went down. I don't know exactly when. Yeah, I could when hear I stopped you. And started. I okay. Yeah. Okay. Go on. So, sorry, guys. I'm just going to repeat what Rahul said was that, uh, <clears throat> like in so I put 18 properties here, 80 property loans here, about 80 loans here. So in that particular case, and then we have, I think uh, for flips, we have three properties open right now, right, Rahul? Yes. Rahul, we have three properties yeah. in the middle of flips? Yes. Okay, so we have three properties in the middle of flips. We have another inventory of about 10, 15 properties that are kind of in limbo where they're all going to go be residential portfolio, rental portfolios. So the 19 um, properties. Oh, 19 properties. Yes. Okay. So 19 properties that are, but those are going to go to the residential portfolio anyways, three of them, two of them are, I'm sorry, one of them is under contract. We're doing whatever possible to get that one closed. Two of them, we have, open uh, properties that we don't have contracts on, right? So just understand that for all of different people, because we tend to do very few uh, flips, some of them are going to go towards wholesales so that we may move it out or we may just give it at cost, right? So, so even for us, it's not that we're in any sort of a financial issue, but you always have to think about what if everything goes in hell and hand basket? That's how you have to think about it. Be prepared for the worst and then expect the best. Right. Always be prepared for the worst and expect the best. So we have a lot of properties that we don't have debt on, but we have to manage that and make sure how do we become put ourselves in the best position. So this is a set of properties here. And then we have the rental portfolio that is divided into 18 properties with residential loans, 80 properties with uh, commercial 30 year fixed loans and then 80 properties approximately with commercial five-year balloon type of loans, right? And so these two are the ones Rahul said that we're deferring and we're deferring because it has no negative impact whatsoever, period, of any kind, including credit, including anything. The positive impact it has is you can have more reserves that you can pile up in your account, but just make sure that you don't take this and then go burn that money somewhere else, ideally. Ideally, you use that, you put it aside, you build up your reserves, and then whenever needed, that's when you start going back to normal. Now, on this side, where these are five-year balloon deals with small banks, why do we not use the same strategy right off the bat? The reason 
we're not using the strategy because we know at the end of the day we have to make these loan payments maybe a temporary um thing at some point it's gonna basically they're gonna collect their money this, you're not gonna just basically be off the hook so we know we want to do that but with these small banks maybe we have 10 15 loans with one bank 10 15 with another bank 10 15 with the bank but these people become critical these people become really really critical six months from now eight months from now why because this is called the secondary market right this market is going to disappear temporarily this is already they have all the loans on here on hold all the hedge funds are like whoa 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 whoa, whoa. we're waiting but guess who's still lending? These people are still lending. Right now, we have a bunch of properties that are gonna go to, uh, gonna go to the portfolio loans. In 2011, 12, 13, 14, how did we grow? We were doing all these loans. Then when this came in and this came in, then we went to these two. See, you always wanna keep the people who are in your court, the people who help you grow, uh, who you wanna do business with, you never want to let them down in any way. You never want to show them any financial weakness because guess what? What if I go back to some of the lenders that are here, I've taken a deferment from them and they're like, well, we like you guys. You guys have always paid. You have a lot of properties. We know that. But you have loans with us that are deferred. We have a loan committee. They're saying we'll loan you the money once your deferment is over. Now, suddenly, I may have great opportunities in the next six months, eight months, a year, year and a half. Because, guys, the opportunities are not going to necessarily, the real opportunity is not, may not be necessarily right now. The real opportunity will be six months to a year, year and a half from now. Because the financial impact in real estate, it always starts 90 to 180 days past the event. In the stock market, it's all based on what's happening today or what they think, in fact, is going to happen tomorrow. If there is bad news that they think is going to come out tomorrow, the stock market reacts. And then it reacts actually once the bad news has dropped already. Then sometimes because they realize the bad news is not as bad or the bad news is already out, the market goes up in the stock market. That's not how the real estate market works. The real estate market is a slow moving market. It always moves behind the news because with real estate, you can't react to it within a day. So make sure that don't just start going nuts today. Why we're saying be cautious, build up reserves, or make sure you know how to do short sales. Make sure you know how to do, negotiate with banks. That becomes more important in the next year, within the next year, year and a half. And you'll see that a ton of opportunities are gonna come. There are 40,000 pre foreclosures already existing before any of this happened. Before anybody even heard of damn Corona, there were 40,000 pre foreclosures in our market. Now, guess what's going to happen? Suddenly, they may get a lifeline for the next six months, eight months, a year. But guess what is going to happen? All we're doing is kicking that damn can down the road. That's all we're going to do. Believe me, we're going to print more money than the world has ever seen. The United States is going to do that, and every country in the world will do that. Period. Go out goes the amount of debt versus GDP and all this BS, right? All the people who like to talk about all the stuff. Why? Because when you shut down the world, we're all fat and happy as a society. We live in a microwave society and we want to fix it today. Nobody wants to wait for anything. We're all that way and we're all that way now across the world, right? We want the political leaders to provide a solution today. The one and only thing they're going to do is print money like it's going out of style. Meaning, what 100,000 buys today, and I can give this to you 100% guarantee. There's only one thing that I can tell you, that when a financial mess happens, some people become very, very, very wealthy because of it. And it's always not based on, it's not based on how much money you have today. It's based on, do you understand how to navigate this mess, right? If you understand how to navigate the mess, that is where we are always, we always think, oh my God, if I had money, I would make more money. No, they're going to print money and they're going to give it away. And you watch, they're going to pump up the markets. It doesn't matter if it's a Republican, it doesn't matter if it's a Democrat that comes into the White House, makes no difference this year. They will, because what they're going to do is we're going to print our way out of this whole mess because there is no other choice. Otherwise, you leave it up to the way it is and a lot of people suffer very badly 
and nobody in America for sure and around the world has appetite for that anymore. Gone are the days where we used to send hundreds and thousands of people to war and we would have 50, 60 people, thousand people dying at a war. Gone are those days. We don't live in that world anymore. Today we want to fix and that's what they're gonna do to kick us out of this problem. So on Monday, we're gonna do a webinar and this is gonna be the next session to this, which is talking about what is the secondary market, what happens whenever and what is happening because this is something very critical. If you are somebody that is investing today in the market or you wanna invest, this is something you need to understand as the situation changes. So Monday, we're gonna do that uh, with Juan Loya and we're gonna go into depth of it. That webinar will be recorded and when it's recorded, listen to it again because it's gonna have a lot of technical details and nuances that may go right over even investors that are advanced investors, right? But it is important to understand how the financial markets react to this based on how they will react to you and then based on how do you gain from it. There is, if you're somebody today that just started buying rentals, that is doing flips, that is right now, is there a reason to panic for you? No. The only saving grace today is this. You are not in this mess alone. Every single human being around the world is in a mess, right, as a society. And that's a saving grace because guess what? Your ship is not the only one sinking. Everybody's ship will sink. And guess what happens? When we all as humanity are in the same damn ship, ship guess what? Nobody wants it to ship. This is very different from 2008. This is different from 2001. This is different from what happened during the depression or the Great Dust Bowl. This is a different thing because it's based on something that nobody could control. And so around the world, they're gonna uh, make uh, different financial decisions that will help everybody, mind you. Now, people who are losing jobs today, the job loss is not a today thing. So what happens to the economy is this. Think about it, something like this happens, all of the excess fat gets cut first, for sure. Then even some of the people who are essential to running the business will get cut. And then when the economy starts coming back, the people who are essential to business will be the first to get hired. Those jobs will get filled first. But that cycle is a six to eight month cycle. So the people who are the excess fat in the economy, they are still going to suffer but they're suffering, you won't see that today, you'll see that a year or two down the road. Because whenever something catastrophic like this happens today, that the dip, the effect of the dip is felt six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 18 months from today in real estate. In Chicago, it may be two years from today because the foreclosure process takes two to five years in a place like Chicago. So it's important for us to stay on top of it. Don't do crazy things today, be conservative, which our message has always been is be conservative. There's a website that if you haven't already gone to, if you haven't seen, please make sure you go there. Just put SBA loans and COVID or SBA loans and Corona and you can pick up this website and it's small business help loans for people who have maybe restaurants, who own rental properties, who are economically affected, right? There are two or three different category of loans. There's a loan for people who have a, uh, let's say you have a bunch of employees, uh, there's loans for those, there's help for those, uh, which is called the check protection program. There's another economic injury and disaster loans uh, that is there. That's the second kind of a loan uh, that is uh, available. And then the third type of a loan is a SBA debt relief um, and a bridge type of a loan also is available. Uh, I know specifically uh, Gary uh, from uh, Gary Davidson from Castle Law and Gina Diaz from um, Diaz Case Law. Both of them are working with people. If you don't know how to take advantage of some of these, some of these are complete grants, right? It's a $10,000 grant a grant meaning that you don't have to pay it back. The details are fairly simple. They're not that difficult for you to fill out, but per company, you can fill that out. If you need help, reach out to Gary Davidson. Uh, he's a, a friend of Chicago RIA, or reach out to Gina, uh, Gina uh, Diaz, 
um, from uh, Gina Diaz case law, both uh, of those uh, law firms will be able to help you at a very, very reasonable cost. And if you are somebody who wants to do a full-blown SBA loan, uh, then these there are details here as well on a lot of your properties. So hopefully some of the thoughts that we shared today uh, have been of help. Hopefully this is something you find of value from our end. As the situation changes, we will continue to address it. Uh, having said that, Rahul, anything else? Lori, no, anything I just else? Uh, want to add the thing is like, you don't have to scare of the situation. Always you have to see that whenever there is a, uh, issues like this in the market, there will be more or new opportunities coming out. You just have to be a little bit cautious about the, uh, the steps you're taking and uh, be disciplined about the money and then keep as much capital as much possible uh, for, so that you, have, you can take control of those uh, opportunities coming your way. But this is not, not something you should just stop doing real estate. Uh, actually, real estate is going to be one of the best ways to still invest after all this thing because at this stage in the, the stock market is going up and down and the real people who don't know how to work with there they're going to lose money i know a lot of people are trying to look and trying to invest there but if you know if you don't understand same thing if you don't understand real estate you'll make mistakes it's the same thing if you don't understand the stock market you'll make mistakes there so i would be very cautious at this stage uh, there's no panic but uh, it's too new uh, for the market, so I would give like another few weeks just to understand where the whole thing is going. There are a lot of uh, disaster programs or uh, relief programs from SBA, and there'll be another one coming from the Chicago, and there'll be some local programs coming out too, so you can keep your eyes and ears open and uh, take benefits of those. But uh, we'll keep updating you on the whatever we, uh, whatever we get from other people. So the other thing really quick is that Ms. Christine Kozil, our friend, asked about the advantages or disadvantage of deferment versus forbearance. We're not saying, do not, you're not asking for a forbearance here, right? You're asking for a deferment, which is being offered to everybody. Forbearance is when you haven't been paying under normal circumstances, if you're behind, that's when a forbearance is done. In this case, you're not asking for a forbearance. You're just basically saying, hey, what are the programs available uh, that relate to this COVID thing? What is the help available? And you want to take advantage of those. That's what you're asking. So you're not going, and there's no, with any of the residential lenders, if you have a residential Fannie Freddie loan, and with any of the commercial um, uh, hedge fund type of loans, there's absolutely no disadvantage to taking the deferment whatsoever. Here, there is a very nuanced and a technical disadvantage to a certain, maybe disadvantageous, but that's more technical, and we will discuss that on Monday uh, when we do the next step of this webinar. That webinar is going to be um, a lot more on the technical side of things, the understanding of the financial markets, how they work. So uh, that should be a fun one uh, for a lot of people. For not a newbies, it'll give you uh, behind the scenes things which we never talk about how all of this really comes together. So uh, we will certainly talk to everybody then. Rahul, again, thank you uh, for uh, your input and hopefully everybody enjoyed. Uh, have a good day, stay safe, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.